Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen Christ is indeed. Good to see all of you here today as we come together to worship and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We're going to move right into things this morning. We just want to say we're glad you're here. May God touch your heart this morning in some way with the power of the risen Jesus. Go ahead, Mary Ellen, take us away.
please be seated. Let us affirm God's transforming power. Holy and living God, like a tomb's darkness that gives away to light, open us to your love, to your acceptance, to your forgiveness, to your peace. Open us to one another and to the possibilities you have in store for us. Give us hope for the future and the passion for life. Here and now, we pray in the name of the one who destroyed death, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I got mixed reviews of whether I should wear this or not. All right. We have some children here. Come on now. I'd like to talk to you for a couple of moments. Come on down if you're two to eighty. Come on down. All right. All right. Come join me here. I'm going to sit down here.
Now the reason I brought this up is because yesterday we had a we had a great time at Gene Autry Park with a whole lot of kids and parents, and we had an egg hunt, and we put eggs all over the fields, and we put them out in the orchard with the scorpions, and we had a great time. <laughs> and so we uh, we had this yesterday as one of our, our props, and it was a lot of fun. And I thought we'd bring it in this morning because it does talk to us a little bit about well, it's not the kind of Easter that we really want to think about theologically. But I'll tell you, there is a lot about Easter that has surprise in it. A lot of surprise. And when you look at the Bible, there's lots of surprises all the time. Have you ever had a big surprise in your life? Have you had, can you think of one? Can you think of a time when you were really surprised? Can you tell me what it was? Mom and Dad gave me a bicep for Christmas. At Christmas? You got a bike? For Christmas? A play set. A play set. A play set for Christmas. Okay. Can you think of a time when you had something really special? Mom gives me a present for Christmas and it was the toothbrush. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who else had a surprise? Emmy, what about you? Can you think of a time when you had a big surprise? You have like a microphone in my face, <laughs> Grandpa. Okay, can you think of a time? Anybody else? All right. What about you two? You think of a time when you had a big surprise in your life? Anything? All right. Daniel, what about you? You think of a time when you had a huge surprise? One sun, one Easter, not Easter, uh, Christmas Day. We got up for a gift, and um, I thought I, I thought the blue bike was for me. No, the blue bike was for the boys. <laughs> That's a surprise for me. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, I remember getting our kids some gifts like that. You know, I didn't expect underwear, Dad. I wanted a skateboard. But you know, Easter is filled with surprises. And one of the things that we read in our scripture lesson this morning, and you'll hear it read later, is when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, she expected to find the body of Jesus. She expected to find the dead Jesus. And guess what? There was no Jesus at all. There was no body at all. And it really surprised her. It had shocked her. And she thought someone had stolen the body. And so she was in grief. And she was crying and she was looking everywhere and asking people, where have they taken my Lord? And it wasn't until someone said her name, Mary, and she realized it was the voice of Jesus that she was able to come to a new understanding that Jesus wasn't dead at all. Jesus was alive. Jesus had risen from the dead, which is why we're here this morning. If that event had never happened, if that had never been recorded, we wouldn't be here together today. There would be no reason to be here. There'd be no church. There'd be no celebration of our Lord and Savior. And so what I want you to think of is, is when you think of Jesus on this day, think of an empty tomb. Don't think of a dead Jesus. Think of an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive around us. Jesus is here. The Spirit is here. And that again is why we are here to celebrate. So I have a couple of things for you here. I'm going to give you an egg. And one of the things you expect to find in an egg is either a little toy or candy. But guess what? In this egg, which is like the tomb of Jesus, you're not going to find anything. <laughs> Because the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. So the first thing I want to give each of you, one of these, one of these, your Pastor Daniel, I'll be down here. Okay, pass these down. I'm going to give you something else too. All right. All right. Make sure everyone's got this. There really isn't anything in it. See, that's the surprise. Jesus really isn't in the tomb. 
He really isn't. You can just stay here for the rest of the hour. That's, that's okay. <laughs>
We join together this day in remembering in prayer those persons whose names we see on the screens. We also lift to our Heavenly Father those we name in our hearts. Bless these persons, Lord, also of our broader community who are struggling and suffering in body and mind and spirit. Bless them in the spirit of the resurrected Christ. And may your comfort and presence strengthen those who are in need of your touch this hour.
then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. The reading from the Gospel is from John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He stood and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the term tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside of the tomb, crying, and as she wept, she stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, Who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener. Sir, she said, If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. This ends the lesson, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
15, 1961, a renowned New Testament scholar spoke to a huge crowd of people assembled in Westminster Abbey. The event was the 350th anniversary of the publication of the authorized version of the Bible. We often call that translation the King James Version, and most of us, many of us at least, grew up on that version of the Bible. In his comments, C.H. Dodd presented a new and finely tuned translation of the scripture. He presented the New English Bible, a milestone at that time. He had been the general director of the New Version. However, what he said about Jesus on that day echoed with more authority than the warm welcome of a new translation. He told that group that the most important event that the early Christians bore witness to was not the cross. What they testified to was the resurrection. And C.H. Dodd said that that is the central truth of Christianity. The cross has no meaning, he said, without the resurrection. The gospel stories bear witness to that truth. Jesus' three-year ministry with his disciples came crashing down like a house of cards. Jesus was arrested, tried, found guilty, and crucified like a common criminal. The cross in itself was not seen as a victory by the disciples. This was not like a sporting event where the vanquished say, gee, we lost, but it was a great game. Only Jesus' enemies saw the cross as a victory. But for Jesus' followers, the crucifixion was a terrible ending, a dream filled with hope and expectations quickly turning to a paralyzing nightmare. Here is the important question. What changed this tragedy into triumph? What changed this tragedy into triumph? Think about it. Think about the transformation that occurred. What turned a group of cowardly and dull disciples hiding from authorities into a group of fearless believers and defenders of their master who would ultimately be willing to lay down their life for Jesus. Certainly, it was not delusion born of grief. These disciples were devout Jewish men, but they were also hardened veterans of the fishing trade. They were not to be drowned in delusion. Certainly, their newfound inspiration did not derive simply from a belief that a good man had died an ugly death on a cross. That happened quite regularly in the Roman world. Injustice, oppression, and often undeserved death was an everyday occurrence. Something far more profound and life-changing was beginning to stir in the hearts and the minds of Jesus' followers. After all, if the resurrection was true, then the ultimate law of life is not the victory of evil, but the power of God's goodness. If Jesus had truly walked from that tomb, then everything he stood for, everything about his love, his compassion, his forgiveness, his justice, his inclusiveness, all of that, that would be powerfully vindicated. The conviction that Jesus was resurrected would light a fire that would begin a movement that would change the world. This tiny group of believers would carry the gospel, literally the good news, to every corner of the earth. But we might ask, we might pause and ask the question, what really is the good news? Have you ever stopped to think about that? If you and I could be teleported back in time into the first century of the common era and walk through the towns and villages and down in Palestine, we would have seen from time to time a symbol drawn on the ground or perhaps etched on a stone or a wall. And it would have been in the shape of a fish. And the head of this fish would always point to a location, 
a place where Christians would be gathering to worship. Every Christian knew what this cryptic symbol meant. It was a reference to the good news of Jesus Christ. The Greek word for fish is ichthus, from which we get the branch of zoology, ichthology, which studies fish. And it just so happens, so happens, at the first letter of each of the Greek words, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, spells ichthus. Thus the word ichthus, or fish, symbolized in the simple drawing of a fish. That became an acronym that referred to the good news. And many scholars believe that the earliest creed of the church going back to right after the time of Jesus' resurrection was simply this, Jesus is Lord. That was it, Jesus is Lord. No theological treatise beyond that, Jesus is Lord. What does that phrase, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, really mean? And the tendency for us in our day and age is to always want to quickly plunge into a discussion of theology. But a huge word of caution at this point, the reality of the resurrection for early believers, it was not theological, it was experiential. It was experienced within the heart and the mind of an individual. One historian, Houston Smith, said, we shall find ourselves quite incapable of understanding Christian theology unless we manage to see clearly the experience, the experience it tries to account for. And so here we have these believers, fueled, fueled by the Holy Spirit, the experience of resurrection faith taking place within them. And it led these early Christians to display some remarkable qualities in their lives. And sometimes we need to pause and look at them. What were they? One of the things that they exhibited was mutual esteem and regard. An early observer of the faith said, see how these Christians love one another. The normal barriers of social class and gender and race were broken down. St. Paul said it well. He said that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor male or female, or slave or free. But another characteristic for Christians, and what they exhibited was this, it was joy. Joy. How interesting. Most Christians were marginalized from mainstream society. Life was tough. Most led very difficult lives. And yet we are told that they possessed an inner peace and contentment that was inexplicable that the world could not give them. But it came from the presence of Christ in their lives through the Holy Spirit. The early Christians seemed to have discovered the secret to living a balanced and contented life. But you still have to ask what gave them the drive to be so alive in their living. The record in scripture suggests that they were delivered from three universal life-killing problems, problems that we deal with today. Christians came to believe that if God could be victorious by bringing Jesus back from death on a cross, then God could bring release in one's life over these burdens to the human soul. The early followers of Jesus found release from fear. Fear, especially the fear of death, which can cripple and inhibit one's openness to the fullness of life. Early Christians found a way past fear. Jesus' words, fear not, fear not. For I am with you, gave strength for the everyday circumstances of life. The followers of Jesus found release from guilt. Guilt, like fear, guilt can paralyze. It can reduce creativity. It can keep one from reaching 
their fullest potential. Real guilt can sink our highest aspirations. And yes, guilt is real. We have failed others. We have hurt ourselves. We have let ourselves down. We have let God down at times. We have ignored God at times. And for real guilt, Jesus offers Christians a profound and real sense of the forgiveness of God. Early Christians also found release from the dictates of the self. The self. There's nothing more confining than an ego that is centered only in the self. And Jesus raised the bar of human worth. God loves each of us totally and equally. And if that's true, as Christians came to believe, then my life, my goals, my words, my actions do not just begin and end with me. For you are as important as me. Early believers learn that there is only one force in the world that can liberate the confines of the human soul from the grip of fear and guilt and ego or self. And that power is the power of love. What did those early Christians experience? My friends, they felt loved by God. And the resurrection of Jesus was a confirmation. It was a seal that says, God loves me, and God loves you, and God was acting in Jesus' life and death to restore a struggling and scarred humanity. God wants us to live in his liberating love. So to those followers of Jesus, Jesus was Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, and this was and is good news. Sometimes resurrection comes in very strange ways. The picture haunted him. The picture haunted him badly. Like many Americans, Reverend John Plummer, minister of Bethany United Methodist Church in Purseville, Virginia, was moved by the Vietnam era Pulitzer Prize winning photo of nine-year-old Phan Thai Kim Phu, naked and horribly burned, running from a napalm attack. How many of you remember this picture? Most of you, if you lived in the Vietnam era. But for Plummer, that picture had special significance. In 1972, he was involved in setting up the airstrike on the village of Tang Bang, a strike that was approved after he was twice assured there were no civilians in that area. Plummer said that even though he knew he had done everything possible to make sure the area was clear of civilians, he experienced new pain each time he saw the picture. It haunted him, and he wanted to tell Kim Fu how sorry he was. After becoming a Christian in 1990, Plummer felt called to the ministry and he attended seminary. And in June of 1996, he learned that Kim Fu was still alive and living in Toronto. The next month, he attended a military reunion and met someone who know, knew both Kim Fu and the photographer. And Plummer learned that on that fateful day in 1972, Kim Fu and her family were hiding in a pagoda in Tang Bang when a bomb hit the building. <clears throat> Kim Fu and others ran into the street where they were hit by napalm being dropped from another plane. She tore off her clothing as she fled. Two of her cousins were killed. And the photographer of this picture and other journalists poured water from their canteens on her burns and she collapsed moments after the famous photo and was rushed by car to the hospital. The girl spent 14 months in hospitals, had multiple surgeries, was operated on by a specialist, San Francisco surgeon. Plummer learned that Kim Fu was speaking at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. 
He went and heard Kim Fu say that if she ever met the pilot of the plane, she would tell him that she forgives him and that they cannot change the past. But she hoped they would work together in the future. Plummer was able to give word to Kim Fu that the man she wanted to meet was there. She saw my grief, my pain, my sorrow, Plummer wrote in an article in the Virginia Advocate. She held out her arms and embraced me. And all I could say was, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, over and over again. At the same time, she was saying, it's all right, it's all right, I forgive, I forgive. It was a moment of unbelievable good news in John Plummer's life. But there's more to the story. In a December 21st, 2017 article for the Wall Street Journal, Kim Fu wrote of the trauma she suffered in the napalm strike, which still brings physical pain daily and requires treatment. But she said even worse than the physical pain was the emotional and spiritual pain. But then she shares how after a long and personal search, this led directly to her conversion to Christianity in 1982. In learning about Jesus, she said that she had never been exposed to this side of Jesus, the wounded one, the one who bore scars. The more I read, the more I came to believe that he really was who he said he was, that he really had done what he said he had done, and that most important to me, he really would do all that he had promised in his word. Perhaps he could help me make sense of my pain and at last come to terms with my scars. And that did happen in her life. Nearly half a century has passed, she says, since I found myself running, frightened, naked, in the pain down that road in Vietnam. I will never forget the horrors of that day, the bombs, the fire, the shrieks, the fear. Nor will I forget the years of trial and the torment that followed. But when I think about how far I have come, the freedom and peace that comes from faith in Jesus, I realize there is nothing greater or more powerful than the love of our blessed Savior. She says, my faith in Jesus has empowered me to forgive those who have hurt and scarred me. It has empowered me to pray for my enemies rather than curse them. And it has enabled me not just to tolerate them, but to truly love them. I will forever bear the scars of that day. And that picture will also serve as a reminder of the unspeakable evil of which humanity is capable. That picture defined my life, but in the end, it gave me a mission, a ministry, and a cause. My friends, here's the bottom line of this message. The story of Kim Fu is a real story about real resurrection. Resurrection is about experiencing the transforming power of God's grace, and it comes to us in many different ways in life. It is indeed what the early followers of Jesus experienced. It is the power of the resurrection that gives to all of us a mission, a ministry, and a cause. And that is what we celebrate this day. We have been so blessed. Christ is risen. Amen.
from the living God, our gratitude pours forth in eagerness to share good news with the world. We invite the oceans to come and receive our tithes and offerings and gifts.
Generous God, we offer these gifts as our testimony to your glory and as our commitment as your disciples. Bless our gifts to your work in the world and to your reign here on earth. Through your blessings of our gifts, may death be destroyed and hope fill all of creation. Amen. Amen. As we come near the end of our service today, we wanted to have you join with us in a powerful affirmation, Easter affirmation about new life and moving beyond the tombs. And so we ask you to join in the emboldened part of these responses. With a stone rolled away came emptiness of a tomb that held captive the crucified of the space that was once filled with death of the cross that now pointed to greater truth of god's love in spite of ourselves with the stone rolled away came questions from those whose world lay shattered from those who could demand living proof from those who were seeking a sign of promise, creating confidence, assurance, and trust. With the stone rolled away came light to illuminate the darkness of suspicion and fear, to dispel the shadows of distrust, anxiety, and insecurity, to radiate the beings of new hope and understanding. Wisdom of ages, with space to be filled with the kingdom of God.
soul and spirit has been blessed. For those who have come for the first time today, we have a greeting area as you exit the sanctuary directly behind you. We have a gift for you, and we have some information for you about Bill Morales. Please take a moment and stop by and visit with one of our pastors. And now please join with me in the benediction. Go forth as God's chosen witnesses to proclaim all you have heard and seen and experienced. 